Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim. Nawajid alim wa ta'alim wa tadzkur wa tadzkir wa naf'a wa intifa' wa lifada wa istifada wa alhas ala tamassuki bi kitabillahi wa sunnati rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa du'a ila al-huda wa dalalah ala al-khair ibtigha'a wajhillah wa maradatihi wa qurbihi wa thawabihi subhanahu wa ta'ala ma'a nutfin wa afiyatin bi rahmatika ya arhama rahimin Allahumma inna nas'aluka alma laduni wa mashrab as-sufi ya hani wa habyagani Allahumma inna nas'aluka alma laduni wa mashrab as-sufi ya hani wa habyagani Allahumma inna nas'aluka alma laduni wa mashrab as-sufi ya hani wa habyagani Sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Amin Tamam Bismillahirrahmanirrahim From the book Muhammad the Perfect Teacher Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam An insight into his teaching methods by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda May we be benefited by him and his knowledge in both abodes Till where he has said in hadith number 10 Which we recited last week Right, so it, uh, we will go through the, 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 the meanings of this hadith this week I will recite it again for the barakah of the hadith, inshallah Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Rawat Tirmidhi fi shama'il an al-Hasan bin Ali Qal, qal al-Hasan bin Ali Sa'altu Abi, Ali bin Abi Talib عن سيرة النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم في جلسائه فقال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دائم البشر سهل الخلق لين الجانب ليس بفظ ولا غليظ ولا صخاب ولا فحاش ولا عياب ولا مداح يتغافل عما لا يشتهي ولا ولا يؤيس منه راجيه ولا يجيب فيه قد ترك نفس قد ترك نفسه من ثلاث المراء والإكثار وما لا وما لا يعنيه وترك الناس من ثلاث كان لا يذم أحدا ولا يعيبه ولا يطلب عورته ولا يتكلم إلا فيما رجاء رجاء ثوابه وإذا تكلم أطر أطرق جلساؤه كأنما على رؤوسه مطير فإذا سكت تكلم لا يت لا يتنازعون عنده الحديث من تكل من تكلم عنده أنصت له حتى يفرغ حديث حديثهم عنده حديث أولهم ويضحك مما يضحكون ويتعجب مما يتعجبون منه ويصبر للغريب على الجفوة في منطقة في منطقه ومسألته حتى إن كان أصحابه لا لا يستجلبونهم يقول إذا رأيتم طالب حاجة يطلبها فارفدوه ولا يقبل الثناء إلا من مكافئ ولا يقطع على أحد حديث حديثه حتى يجوز فيقطع فيقطعه بنهي أو قيام تمام Alright, so here, right, he's now going on into the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's going on to the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sara, Sara, uh, can you go to? Is my room open? See, my mic is there. My mic is there. It's in the luggage bag. You know my luggage bag in Thai's room. Inside there is my mic. Should be there. Ready for it? Right. 
So Imam Tirmidhi narrates in Ishama'il on the authority of Hassan bin Ali who said Al-Hussein bin Ali this is, Oh Al-Hussein, no, I read it as Hassan Al-Hussein bin Ali said I asked my father Ali bin Abi Talib about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's manner with those who were sitting with him He said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was always smiling He had an easygoing nature and was soft-hearted He was not stern and hard-hearted Did not shout Was not obscene Did not find fault with anything And did not joke excessively He would display a lack of interest in those things Which he did not like or did not approve of He did not disappoint any person Who hoped to receive something from him Nor did he refuse him totally He himself abstained from three things Argumentation Excessive talking or excessive wealth And things which did not concern him He saved the people He saved the people from three things He did not criticize anyone Did not insult anyone And he did not search for the faults of anyone He only spoke that for which there was hope of reward When he spoke, all those who were present lowered their heads As if It was as if birds were sitting, were sitting on them. They only spoke when he had stopped speaking. They did not speak at all, once in his pres- at all at once in his presence. When anyone from amongst them spoke, they remained silent until the person completed whatever he had to say. The one who spoke first would continue speaking until he had finished. And he would join them in their laughter and their expression of surprise. And he would tolerate the rudeness and, and the incessant Questioning of a stranger To such an extent that his sahaba would hope that a stranger would come and converse with him He was he used to say to them When you see a person in need, you should help and guide him He never accepted any praise if it went beyond what he actually was He did not interrupt the conversation of a person Unless the latter went beyond the bounds or digressed from the truth If anyone did this, Rasulullah wasallam would either stop him or walk away. Right? So you can see this hadith. No, mashallah, it's a very, these are the hadith from, from the Shama'il, Imam Tarmizi, which you know, if you have time, uh, or if you're able to go and learn the Shama'il. And the Shama'il is one of the important sciences you know, of, of, of Rasulullah wasallam. There are basically three uh, groups you know, of sciences, like three types of sciences, whereby you get to know Rasulullah wasallam, And they are hadith. Uh, you learn hadith to know the, the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You learn the seerah, the biography of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the shama'il. The shama'il are a, a group of hadith that describe the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So even so, while they are made up of hadith, and just like the seerah, the seerah is also made up of hadith. It's all back to hadith. Right, but the Shama'il specifically talks about the physical features of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his ways, his mannerisms, and how the people were with him. While the Sirah speaks about his life story, right? So what happened? What happened? So it, 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 it surrounds uh, occurrences in his life. Whereas the Shama'il speaks about his person, right? as as a person himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all these hadiths you get from the Shama'il. Right, you find it in the Shama'i. So these are of the, of the most amazing hadith, you know, about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Because Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, and who is Sayyidina Ali? Sayyidina Ali, right, was someone who came into the house. He was the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was someone who came into the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, when he was 10 years old, right, when he was 10 years old, he came into the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he grew up there, and thereafter he married the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and became the the son-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he lived very near the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he married his daughter, Sayyidina Fatimah Zahra. And the house would be very very close near the masjid. So, so Sayyidina Ali would be someone right, who would know exactly right, the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And here we see the question by Sayyidina Hassan, especially in the previous hadith. Sayyidina Hassan asked. Uh, Sayyidina Ali to describe to him Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because when or Sayyidina Hussein was one who asked in this, in, this, in this hadith because when Rasulullah passed away Sayyidina Hassan was 8 years old and Sayyidina Hussein was 7 years old or 6 years old right on a different uh, uh, opinion right so basically so basically here you see right that they were too young 
uh, to actually remember uh, about their grandfather right, more than what they, they actually you know, managed to catch from their grandfather. So they, and, and here you, you used to see how they really guard over wanting to know as much as they can about their grandfather and about the Prophet and they will memorize his hadith and they will relate the hadith. And so you can imagine them at this age being in their, in their teens. Right, or in, you know, in the young age, somebody they ask their father, tell us more, tell us more about our grandfather, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, after he has passed away. So the first thing Sayyidina Ali said, like about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which we all know already. You know, anyone who who does not know this, right, is quite, you know, like where have you been, lah? Eh? <laughs> if you don't know this, this, this characteristics about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the first thing he said, right, is that he's always smiling, right. So always smiling is something every Muslim you need to know this about your prophet. Uh, he was he was described to be somebody always you know with a with a very pleasant face uh, a gentle disposition he was always pleasing uh, to look at and and of the sahabas who said that i never saw rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam except that he smiled at me uh, every time i saw him he was with a smile he was with a smile uh, subhanallah you know it is of his uh, sunnah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right to smile I, at uh, his companion, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it is a big sunnah uh, for us to actually implement. Uh, it is a, a, a serious sunnah uh, for us to implement onto those who are uh, around us. So here, then the next one he says. So he was always smiling. He was easygoing in nature. And there's a hadith about us. There is a hadith about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. That the fire of hell is haram, right? It is forbidden on every easy-going believer, right? So every easy-going, you know, it's, it's easy on people. So they take your stuff, they break your stuff, they 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 they, they, they forget things, they whatsoever. You're just, you know, you're all about, you know, it's okay, you know, it's a mistake, but well, mistakes, it's fine. You're not hard on people, right? When they actually do, when they actually make mistakes, or when when they when they slip, or when they forget something, or when they, you know, they they, they 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 falter in in, in their ways. Uh, you have no you have no issues. It doesn't bother you whatsoever. Uh, it's, it's okay. I keep saying it's okay. It's okay. It's no problem. Right? And 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 you let it be easy for people to be with you. Right? On the on the opposite end. Right? Of course, if every if every tree or so on Islam, we will see the opposite. So as to know what not to be. Right? So for for smiling, the opposite is not to be frowning. Right, that is, you know, we should we need to strive that we actually don't uh, frown at people or don't come to people with a very, you know, black face and, you know, especially our children, right? You know, the, 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 the extent by which your child actually smiles is how much you smile. <laughs> like, if you are somebody who is always stressed up and always frowning and always this and always that, right, that the child begins to also take on that characteristics. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is always smiling, and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had an easygoing nature. Right? He was not someone who made things hard for people. Right? He was easy on them. Right? When they, uh, as how they interacted with him, right? it was very. He was, he was somebody who was pleasing to be around. Right? Very easy to be around and right? be an easy person. Right? So when, so if you're someone who's uptight, so the opposite of easygoing is you're uptight. Right? so everything someone does, you, you know, you, you, especially people who get hurt very easily, or you're very sensitive about things. Right, you know, you're, 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 you know, you, you, it's difficult. It's difficult for people to actually make mistakes around you. So when they make mistakes around you, then you get, you know, you, 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 cannot, you cannot carry it right, in a way. So easy going. Masayna Muhammad. Sorry. <laughs> Are you here? <laughs> you can write more. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sometimes when you're writing on the book, right, like, for idealize, it limits you. Because right, if you have like a notebook, you can write a lot. But then again, you must know where you put your notebooks. <laughs> and for me, I actually like, I prefer to drink on books. I write on books themselves. Right? My book, all my notes are there. Right? But Allah Then the rest of it you must memorize. Lah. You must put in your, in your memory. Alright, so he was always smiling. He was easygoing. Right? Uh, you know, doesn't get, doesn't get perturbed by things. Doesn't get angry easily. Right? To get angry easily is, you know, of not of the nature of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was not someone who got angry easily, right? And but he was somebody who always think the best of people and forego, you know, and, and just let go of things that happen around him, right? And not take everything that people say to heart, right? But they, he would just, you know, let it go.
uh. so to teach them right is to de- to remove from yourself emotion so you hear you're talking about emotions uh, so your child does something wrong you teach them in a very respectable way it means the, the the lesson is driven is you drive forth the lesson to them right? so you tell them about the mistake you, you clarify to them what was wrong what was done that was wrong right without showing emotion on your part it means you don't show anger you don't show it uh, you know any form of like uh, negative emotion but you 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 very clearly you can be firm you be firm very clearly inform them right what was undesired uh, of their behavior and then uh, drive off the point lah. Uh, anyway so then then they will focus on what you're saying if you if you come to them angry they will focus on your anger right but if you come to them gentle you know and uh and it's subhanallah subhanallah he was always smiling in an easygoing nature and he was soft-hearted sallallahu alaihi wasallam Right, soft-hearted, meaning, subhanAllah, he, he had compassion for people. He had mercy on people. Right, and he always placed people before himself. And prioritized people. Right, so that was the way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, the way, the, way, the way they describe him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you just follow these first three, right, you know, subhanAllah, you'll be like of the most beloved of people, you know, in, 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 in the lives of those who are around you. Like if you're just always smiling, it means you're always cheerful, right? I mean, there are some people, and, and the things that, you know, be more cheerful to, those, to, do, to your family, right, than you are to, uh, to outsiders. Because for most of us, the disease is that we are cheerful to outsiders. And when it comes, it comes to our own family, you know, our own sisters, our own brothers, our own parents, right? that's when, you know, we frown and we are grouchy and we, are, we, we snap at them, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, Right, that uh, that it, this is for for wives, but it can be stretched over family. Right, uh, the best of you are the best to his own family, which means wife in, in the hadith, to his own family. And I am the best to my family. Right, so the best of you are the best, you know, best to their own spouses, to their own children, to their own those who are closest to them. They are the best to these people. Right, so subhanallah, you know, just the first three traits. If we can implement this, you know, as a teacher, so you're seeing as a teacher, so a teacher is always smiling. Right, you see that the children, the, the, the students, you smile at them first. You're easy going. Right, sometimes kids, they make mistakes and they, 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 they falter and whatever. You do correct them, but you need to correct them. But sometimes you're having fun. You see them having fun. Right? And then, so, you know, you let it go. Let them have fun. Like, it's not during the class. They all went there and they began drawing on the whiteboard, on the blackboard. They're all four years old, four years old. Let them have their fun first, then you call them. Right? So, you know, like, you don't like, scold them and say, who let you draw on the blackboard and whatsoever. Like, they're four-year-olds. Right? So, let them easy going. Easy going. If, if it's not harmful what they're doing, let it be. Right? And then call them back. Right? But if it's harmful what they are doing, then you have to see according to their age as to how you actually speak to them. Right? So, if they're younger, right, I would say four or five-year-olds, they're, 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 they're small kids. And right? you have to see how you speak to them as to the level of their understanding. Right? Because if, if you show a lot of emotion and a lot of displeasure, then most of them will just focus on your <laughs> emotion and your displeasure instead of what you're actually trying to say. Right? But for older uh, children, right, you will try to rationalize to them. And you speak to them in a way they will never forget what you say. Right? In a way. And subhanAllah, you know, it's, it's the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Easygoing nature and soft-hearted. Right? Soft-hearted means kasihan. You know, have mercy, rahma, right, uh, on, on people who are around them. He was not stern and hard-hearted. It's the opposite, eh? He was not stern and hard-hearted. He did not shout. Right? And this is where we have the Dalil that he does not raise his voice. He, did not, he never raised his voice. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He never raised his voice. So, really, in your teaching, in your upbringing of your children, in your teaching of children, your students, the raising of the voice right, is not part of the sunnah. It's not haram. Right, but it's not the best way. Because what is of the sunnah is the best way. And if you raise your voice, you know, and you shout or you scold people, right, and then, then, then that you're, you're taking away that is not the best way. Right, and perhaps one of the most uh, damaging ways right, of teaching people. Right. Right, he did not shout, he was not obscene. Right, and Rasulullah was the most shy of persons. Right, he would be so shy, they would describe him to be that he was sh- more shy than a virgin girl in her house. Right, if, and you've seen this woman, like for our, our virgin girls are not shy. 
Right? If you if you go to other countries, I mean, go to Tari, for example, all the girls are mashallah, they're all out eh, in the in the streets. If you go to places like Tarim, they are so shy. If they're an unmarried woman, they're so so shy. It's so you know, it's it's amazing to watch them, right? Because they will they will not even come out of their rooms. They will stay in their room. They're so shy. In front of women also, they're shy in front of married women also. So sometimes they will come to they will they will be you come to their house and they will actually cover their face in front of a woman. They will cover their face out of their shyness amongst people. So people of the past. You know when they are, and, and and I know in the, the culture in Tarim, and when a girl comes of age, right, she they will begin to keep her at home, right, because she is ready to get married. I said they begin to uh, look for a groom for her, and they, they will marry her off, right. So they begin to get keep her at home, and she begins to develop a very strong shyness right, that is in her. I right? say so it's for us to understand. The people of the past they are different than people of now. So you see, when they say Rasulullah was more shy. Than a virgin girl in her own house, right? you can imagine the kind of shyness that was. So when he spoke about affairs, you know, and he was a, he's a prophet, so he has to speak about issues that will be shy. Right? We come from shyness to, to speak about these things, but he has to speak about these things because of, of the laws around it. Right? So what happens between the husband and wife? So what happens, you know, when you go to the bathroom? What happens, you know, like he will, he will say these kind of things, right? But he would you always use terminology that would cover. And that means he won't say it outright, right, but he will use terminology that would actually allude to it. Right, so, so a terminology that is, that is, is from shyness that he speaks that way. So it's actually, it is of a sunnah of a sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to actually use uh, terminology right, for your children, especially to refer to things that are shy. Right, so you don't you know, call their private parts as what, you know, the, 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 the terms for it, right, but you will just say, you know, your, like, you know, uh, your, your private part, you will say something like that, what is private to you, or you say your shame shame for, 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 for kids. Like you use, you use terminology to cover. Satr. Right? It's something that is, that is, that is uh, of the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Terminology, eh? And to cover over. Right? Even between husband and wife also. Right? It is actually of the Sunnah, right? Be- even between you and your husband, right? to use terminology that is more dignified. Right? And then as opposed to use crude terminology. Right. So it's not of the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. So he, did, he was not obscene at all. Right. He, did not, he, was not, he didn't like any form of obscene talk. Right. So for us, you know, we don't, inshallah, we don't engage in obscene talk. Right. But we watch you know, on, on TV, on sitcoms, on comedies, right, obscene talk. Right. And Rasulullah hated these things. He hated right, anyone who would say, who would speak about obscene things. Right. So he hated it. Right. So for us, you know, our, our, our time, and a lot of the, the dramas and the comedies, and it's all obscene. And we know that it's obscene. We know it. Right? And sometimes, you know, uh, unfortunately, people allow their children to watch all these things. Right? Because, but it's like obscene things. So you yourself, you feel very shy right, to watch it and if your son is there. You know, so you're there and your son is there. You're, you feel very shy if your if if adult son or your, your teenage son is there and you're watching this film right, or movie that has all these things in there and you feel super shy. So it shows how you should not actually uh, go for these things like, as far as you can. Alright, so he was always smiling. Right, so he was, uh, he was not obscene. He did not find fault with anything and did not joke excessively. I right, didn't find fault with things uh, around him. Right, and basically he was, was calm. And he was somebody who was uh, easygoing. Right. And he did not joke excessively. So it is of you know blameworthy character, right? To laugh out loud and to joke excessively. Joking excessively meaning to go into things that are lies as you joke. Right? So when you even when you, when you, when you when you are teasing, right? when you are teasing, it is not okay to say what is not true. Right? It means to, to, to stop yourself from saying what are lies. Right? So you cannot I mean to make up stuff it's so easy for us, eh? It's so easy for us when we want to tease, to joke. Right? It's so easy to just make up stuff, to trick people. It's all haram. It's all lies. It falls under lies. Right? So you trick people, to de- deceive them, to just to play with them, to, make, to play a fool. It's all falls under lies. Rasulullah wasallam was known never to say a lie. Right? So even his joking was truth. Right? And we know the story, the, the, the famous story of him when an old woman came to him. And said, Rasulullah, am I in paradise? And then he says, "Oh, people are not in paradise. Oh, there are no old people in paradise. 
And then she turned away and she began to cry. And I think that she, he meant him. Then she called, she, he called her back and he said that what I mean is that when you go to paradise, you'll be young. Right? But we won't go to paradise old. Right? So that's what I meant. <laughs> right? And then there was another man who came to Rasulullah and said, right? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, give me, I need a ride for jihad. I need, I need, to, I need an animal to go for jihad on. And then the Rasulullah said, I will give you, I will give you the child of a she camel. And the man said, what can I do with a child with a she camel? I can't ride it. And then Rasulullah said, aren't all camels a child of a, of a she camel? <laughs> Every camel is a child of a she camel. <laughs> he's just like that. You know, it's kind of like, like very, uh, very witty. He's very witty. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he does not lie. He doesn't lie. He's a very witty person. You can see, I mean, smart jokes. Quite smart in <laughs> the jokes, right? But I mean, just for, for fun. You know? <laughs> but they are not lies. He does not trick people. Doesn't bluff them. You can't, you know, bluffing lah. Bedek je. You can't bedek people. Right? You can't uh, uh, say what is not true. Mm. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you can get it perfect. That is okay. It's an omission. That they ask you, alright, you don't have to explain. Yep, it's okay. Alright, and then he said, he would display a lack of interest in those things which he did not like or did not approve of. So meaning he won't say anything, right? But they will see in his face that this was something that he did not desire. Right? And they will stop doing it. Right? So, and the reason why he, does, he won't say is so that it will not be made haram or makruf. Right? But he just basically didn't like it. Lah. Right? In a way, for, from his own preference. So he as a prophet, if he said something, don't do that, you can't do that. Right? It, might, it will make certain things fall into hukum of haram and makruf. Right, so sometimes he will not like something, or he is or something, but it's not haram nor makru, right? But he, so he will show in his face that he does not like these things. And right, so, for example, like they used to eat, uh, the desert Arabs used to eat this kind of lizard that, you know, of their time, you know, that is not uh, haram, right? I'm not sure what lizard it is, but they used to eat it, right? But they, when, they, when, they, when they first, when they once killed it and they brought it to Rasulullah, right, he didn't eat from it. So they wondered, right, is it haram? Rasulullah, can we eat this thing, this, this, this animal? Right? And then he said that, no, but I'm not used to it. And I'm not used to this food. Right? It's, just, it's just that. You know, it's just that I'm not used to the food. Right? So, so he would show that. So he would display a lack of interest in those, in those things which he did not like or not approve of. He did not disappoint any person who hoped to receive something from him. And right? this is one of the Sunnah of Rasulullah SAW, never to turn them down. And to always give something, even if it's something very small, to always give something to them. He did not refuse them totally. And so it is, you know, it's macro, lah. so you smile at them and, and so on. And then he says here, he himself abstained from three things. Right? There are three things that we need to uh, train ourselves on to, 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 to leave these things. First thing, argumentation. Right? It is not desired right, to always argue, argue, argue. And if your children have this habit of always arguing, right, try to stop it. Right, not to allow the argumentation to continue. But to just you know, put your foot down and stop the argumentation. Right, khalas. Right, people can, 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 you can exchange views on things, but argumentation is not about exchanging, exchanging views. Argumentation is basically you, you are on the same view, right, you are not exchanging views, but you keep trying to force your opinion or your view. That is argumentation. Right? And that Imam Shafi's mazhab, Imam Shafi said right, that uh, argumentation about the religion amongst the awam, that means the common person, is haram. Right? Haram. Right? Argumentation about the religion amongst the common person is haram. Because most likely you fall into the haram more than you fall into the halal. <laughs> right? you, because you're all common people. So you don't have the, the knowledge of the religion. And argumentation amongst the ulama, it is... Uh, you know, it is best uh, not done. Uh, it's best not done. Right? That, means they, that means they can just lay out their points and lay out their points and that's it. Right? But you don't argue with each other. Like Imam Shafi'i never argued right, with, with Imam Malik or Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, even though they're of different mazhabs, he never argued with them. Right? But he always just, you know, they have their opinions, they have their opinions and that's it. Right? To every person, their opinion. Right? So there is no uh, argumentation. Right? And also some was someone who he that you will not find anywhere in the seerah or the hadith of him arguing. Right? You can't think of a single hadith right, whereby there was argumentation in his speech. 
Right? But it was clear right, and people accepted. Right? Uh, he was someone who did not argue. Right? He, did not, he did not excessively talk. I right? know excessive talking or unnecessary talking from Rasulullah SAW. Or no excessive wealth. I right, saw so Zuhud, eh? Zuhud in speech also, eh? So there's some Zuhud in speech also. He's not, he's not even excessive in the way he speaks to people and, and the way he, what he talks about. Things which do not concern him, he left. Right? La ya'nihi. And it's from a hadith about Rasulullah Sallam said, Min husnin Islam mar'i, tarkuhu la ya'nihi. Right? From the beautification of a person's Islam is him leaving what does not concern him. Right? So if it does not concern you, then leave it. Let it be. And we must train ourselves. Like, it's something that for me also I struggle with. Oh, this is all I'm like I'm struggling with. I have to try and really make it part of your character. Because it's the character of Rasulullah. Right? So a human being, you know, the, the Muslim, we have this perfect human being in front of you. Right? And he's perfect in his character in every aspect of himself, but most so in his character. Right? Because of the hadith which we mentioned from the beginning of this lesson, where Barasam said, In Nama Bu'estu li utamima makariman akhlaq. I for surely I was only sent to perfect noble character. Right, so if there's anything that we need to take from Rasulullah SAW and focus and, and really strive you know, our, in our entire lives to try to get from Rasulullah SAW is his noble character. Right, his behavior with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his behavior with the people right, around him. And right, that is something we need to strive. Lah, eh? And then he says here, and he saved people from three things. He did not criticize anyone. Uh, he was not critical. Uh, of course, he gave feedback. Uh, feedback is different. Criticize would be something like, like in, this, in this situation, uh, it would be harsh. Uh, so he did feedback uh, and he, did, he would say, you know, where they, 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 can, they can improve, uh, but in a very gentle way. Right? He did not insult anyone. Uh, so insulting is, is, is out of it. Uh, it's out of the, out of the question uh, because insulting is, is not even, it's not even beneficial. Right, insulting, it just makes people feel bad about themselves. Right, so while we ourselves, we don't let our kids insult anybody, and we ourselves, we should not be going around insulting people. Right. He did not search for faults of anyone. Right, the searching of other people's faults means seeking out, spying on them, going to their phone, going to their, their diary, whatsoever. Right. Looking for the faults of people or asking people about you know, others to find out their faults, all of it is haram. Right, la tajassasu, right? Don't spy, right? Don't don't suspect, right? Don't uh, sniff out the faults of people. That is of not of the uh, sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He did not. Uh, he only spoke that for which there was hope of reward. Can you imagine if you all did that? Eh? All your words that come out of your mouth, right? You look and you focus. Is there reward in this? Is there benefit in this? Like all every word that comes out of your mouth. When he spoke, all those who were present lowered their heads. Like out of respect for Rasulullah as if birds were perched on them. Right, so they would sit, you know, in such a way whereby they would just listen to Rasulullah. There were of the Sahaba. When you look at the Sahaba, the, the, the hadith that describe the physical features of Rasulullah, all those hadith come from young sahaba, from children. Right, children or, or youth or, or young like young teenagers, right? Those Sahaba, right, they were the ones who would describe Rasulullah's face to the detail. Right? But if you ask, if you ask uh, the older Sahaba, right, to, dis- to describe Rasulullah and right, most of the older Sahaba are, are not able to. And the reason is because the older Sahaba, the adults, they never look at him in his face. Right? They always see so much awe of Rasulullah and they never actually looked at him in his face. Right, so after he passed away, like they couldn't describe him. Right, because he never actually once gazed into him, him like that and stared into his face. But the young ones, of course, they do it all the time. <laughs> the young ones will just stare at him. <laughs> right, and just look at his face and observe. And they would count how many grey hairs he had. And they would do, you know, like Sayyidina Anas and Sayyidina Aisha. They were the young ones. And they are the young ones. Sayyidina Abdullah bin, uh, bin Abbas, Sayyidina, Sayyidina bin Abbas, Sayyidina bin Omar. They are all the young sahabas. Right, they would look and they would stare at the feet of Rasulullah SAW and they would really observe everything about his face. So it's all these hadith right, that come and they speak about the, facial, the, the physical features of Rasulullah SAW. They come from the younger Sahaba and right, not from the older Sahaba. They were, there's, there's a hadith from the older Sahaba who said that when I entered Islam, I never looked into the face of Rasulullah SAW. Uh, before Islam, he used to. After Islam, he stopped. 
And so if you ask me now to describe him, I can't. I can't actually describe how he was. But I knew his, the way he was, but I can't tell you exactly how his face was. Right? Because of how much awe, and much of the Sahaba, how they really... Uh, and and of, the, of the disbelievers who said, you know, that they have seen the kings of Kisro and the kings of Rome, right? And they, but they have never seen a people right, who exalt their leader as how the companions of Muhammad exalted Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, it was like no, there was no king in this world or no leader in this world. You know, they would, they would run after his wudu water, they would run after his hair, everything about him. Where he sat, they would sit. Where he walked, they would walk. Right? Everything about him to Allah, like they were, you know, they were, they, they, they were on it. Right? So there's, there's not a king in this world, right, who is like that. And right? whenever he needed money to, you know, to, to lend to the poor, right, they were on it. They would just give their money. Right, so, they would, you know, how is king in this world? They will have their subjects right, treat them in that way with so much love and honor and respect. And just the Sahaba themselves, right, the way they treat Rasulullah is a proof of his prophethood. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I say he's the best of leaders, eh? The best of leaders, the best of. So there was one book that I read. I can't remember where about the leadership of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And that book was written for those who are leaders. I like, like if you happen to be a president or you happen to be of, of a company or, a, or, a, or even a country or whatsoever, that book was written right, for people who are leaders. That means you happen to be over people. Right? So how, what is the sunnah of leadership? Because leadership at the end of the day, leadership is just uh, servanthood. Right? You are a servant of your subjects. Right? That is leadership. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Umar, they understood that. Sayyidina Umar, Sayyidina Ali, right? they understood that when you are a leader, you are a servant. Right? You, are at the, uh, you, you are responsible over your subjects and all of them are above you. That means they are all prioritized ahead of you. Right? You are not, you are the last priority. Right? You are the, last, the, most, the, least, most, the, the least important person in your life. Right? As this. And Sayyidina, Ab, Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz, right? we know that before he became Khalifa, he was rich. Right, Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he is the grandson of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, the great grandson of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. Right, so when he became Khalifa, he gave away everything he owned. Right, and he lived very simply because he realized that now, as a Khalifa, right, he cannot have more than the people. He can't. Right, he, will be, he will be at the lowest level. Right, and, and, and so as to ensure that everybody is, has more than him. Right, that is true leaders, true leaders who don't take the wealth of the people. And rather, they give their wealth to the people. And so Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, you know, subhanAllah, he, in his leadership, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Omar forced him to take wage. So, because Sayyidina Omar said, you know, you, you, you have to do your, your business and all that. You know what, we need you to be freed up for your Khalifa position. We will give you a wage. And Sayyidina Omar forced it on Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he took the wage, right? And he uh, used the wage to buy a piece of land. So before he passed away, he told Sayyidina Aisha, I have this piece of land that is equals to the wage that Omar gave throughout these two and a half years that I've been Khalifa. So I want you, so Sayyidina, I want you, I know he's his wasiat lah, I want you to sell this land and take the money and give it back to the Muslims. <laughs> Meaning for his two and a half years, he took no wage. And no wage for his service as Khalifa. These are people of taqwa. They're, just, they're just so scared. They do anything wrong in their positions. But these are people of long ago, or long ago, long past. Right? They are a different breed altogether. Eh? Right? They are different. Well, they have a taqwa that is for us just to, just to keep to halal wealth. Right? That already you know, is hard <laughs> enough for us. You know, subhanallah. Right? Uh, so, so they will sit you know, with as if birds were sitting on them. They only spoke when he stopped speaking. Right? Yeah, they had respect for, uh, they, they can't respect for him. They do not speak all at once in his presence, and there is makru, right? For you to actually, you know, uh, uh, like students to speak all at once to the teacher, it's makru. Right? So if you see your student, your fellow classmates speaking to the teacher, you need to wait, right, for them to finish, and then you, and then you have your your turn. That's so why in our system there is a raising of raising of the hands, so you can wait right, in between. Right? Of course, it is rudeness lah. It is very rude. If people are talking to, you, to your teacher, and you're talking to them at the same time. And of course, you know, uh, for your children, we should be training them on that. And if I'm talking to someone and you want to talk to me, you come and you wait. And you wait until I'm done and I turn to you and then you talk to me. Right? But don't, you know, shout at me while I'm talking to somebody else. Right? So, but they will begin to do that. Right? So you need to just slowly train. 
Right, so, so slowly repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Right, just keep just keep repeating until one day they get the idea. Right, they don't interrupt you when you are talking to somebody else. All right, and then he says here, when anyone amongst from among them spoke, they remained silent until the person completed whatever he had to say, and the one who spoke first would continue speaking until he had finished. And he would join them in their laughter and their expression of surprise. And that shows the humility of Rasulullah So he's not like above them, you know, or you know, beyond them. You know, but you know, if they find it funny, he will laugh with them. You know, and it's a sunnah to actually laugh together when, 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 when children laugh. It's a sunnah. And I know they laugh at everything. <laughs> they laugh at a lot of funny, funny things. But in the small, small kids at three old boy, they laugh at things. It's a sunnah for you to actually laugh also. I to, to to show them, you know, that, that you know it is funny. <laughs> you know, whatever they found that's funny lah. It's, it's just to, 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 to make them feel good. Because sometimes when you laugh at something and it's and no one else laughs, you feel bad. <laughs> like, like I'm the only who thinks it's funny and funny. Yeah, nobody else finds it funny. Right? So you know, if it's something that is supposed to be funny, lah, but it's something that is something that is uh, if it's something that is mean, or something that is not appropriate to laugh at, then you put your foot down. And we don't laugh at such things. These are not, you know, uh, uh, things that we laugh at. As Muslims, right, but like they, they laugh at. I know my nephew has very a very interesting sense of humor. Is Adam? He will what he do? Eh? I don't know. He will find something and he will make his Lego and he like look, must see. There's a red here and there's a blue here. Funny, right? <laughs> no, like, very funny, Adam. <laughs> and you just laugh, lah. Like, you just laugh at the the the, the humor that he seemed to have. <laughs> Very, myself, it's a very interesting humor. Eh? It's a very interesting humor. <laughs> right, but it's the way of Rasulullah SAW that when people laugh, he will, he will laugh together with them if the, heart, if the laugh is okay to laugh at. Right? It's not something that is uh, uh, undesired. Right. Right. Uh, and, and he will be surprised at what they would feel surprised at. Right, so whatever they will be surprised or they will be, be amazed at, he will also be amazed at these things. Right, and, and, and most often, whenever he's amazed, he would uh, say something of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or of the next world. Right, so if they're amazed, you know, at uh, like, if, if they're amazed at, at something dunyawi, right, then he will say, yes, it's beautiful, but don't you know, you know, in paradise, and he would describe something of paradise that is greater than that. You know, so as to attach their hearts. You're so amazed by this. You're amazed. Oh, in paradise, subhanAllah. You know, and sometimes you wonder, you know, when you're in this world and you see the, 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 the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mountains, the seas, the rivers, and you're amazed. Right, so whenever, thank you, Adam. Thank you. Oh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, MashaAllah. Yeah, that's Adam. <laughs> right, he's a very, he's a sweetheart, lah, eh? He's such a sweetheart, <laughs> that boy. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he randomly makes cards for me. Random. It's not my birthday. <laughs> it's not just there, so, but he likes eh? The Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, he wrote on top. Later he will explain to me what it is. It's a story. Later on he will explain. <laughs> Alright. MashaAllah. <laughs> He asked because he once asked me for my birthday. Long time ago lah. He said he called me from my brother's phone. He called me. He said, uh, Masi, what do you want for your birthday? He's <laughs> four years old. <laughs> I said, I want a card from you. <laughs> See, I think that's what, that's what began everything. <laughs> See, I want a card from you. Draw, draw a card from Masi lah. Okay. So my birthday came a card. Follow week came another card. <laughs> now came another card. <laughs> you don't see how many cards, eh? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, inshallah. Right, so I mean, you 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 you're amazed by what they're amazed by, right? And then and then also, I mean, I'm sure when you have children, you, you know how to do this. Like right? when they when they uh, they find something uh, funny, you have, you find it also funny. And then sunnah also some it is from it is from uh, humility, right? To be humble that you actually do this because you're with the people, and right? so the people find it find it amazing. You also find it amazing. Like oh, this is nothing, you know. Like, you know like don't, don't don't be that way. Right? Be with the people. He would tolerate the rudeness and incessant questioning of a stranger. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A Bedouin, like a Bedouin will come, right? And they will be rude in their ways. And here you see the mercy of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to see people from where they come from, 
Right, they are Bedouins from the desert. The way, their way is harsh. They are not, you know, refined in their character. So he understand where they are from. He will not scold them, right? But as they stay with him, they begin to learn good character. You know, of a Bedouin who saw some kissing Zainal Hassan Zainal Hussein uh, on their heads, right? And he said to him, "Do you kiss your children?" And the Bedouin said, "Out of, out of pride, out of pride." And the Bedouin said, "Out of pride, I have ten children. And I never kiss one of them." You know, because it's, it's a sign of manliness for them. You know, it's manly for me to not kill my kids, to not, to not kill, to not kiss my children. Right? It's manliness. And then Rasulullah said that, that what can I do if Allah has removed the mercy right, in your hearts? Right? To, to explain to them that it is from mercy right, that you kiss children right, on, uh, and you hug children and you make them feel loved. Right? It's from mercy that you do these kind of things for people. Right? Uh, and, that, and that caused people to change. And they changed their ways and they saw what for some would do, they would also do. He would play with children. Some, and there was a hadith that Rasulullah was once on his all fours. Right? And Sayyidina Hassan and Sayyidina Hussein were mounted on his back. Like a horse. Ah. Like a horse. Ah. How you do it in some fifth kids? You're on your fours, all fours, and the two kids are on their back. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr came in. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, what a, what a, what a fine horse you, you, you both have. You know, because Rasulullah at the bottom. Right? And then uh, Rasulullah said, no, rather, what fine horsemen they are. <laughs> I mean, like, it's all, the hadith is all recorded. You know, that's how they would play. And they would play, they would, you know, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Hussein. Right? So, I mean, so you don't think that it's beyond you, you know, to actually get down to their level and get down to, and do silly things with them and, you know, do all kinds of merepe. If they want to play whatever nonsense game, also you play with them. Right, they kind of think, and you try to understand their games. <laughs> what are they doing? Right, and that will actually build rapport. You build rapport with them, and when you build rapport, building rapport is very important when it comes to teaching. Right, if you want to teach, you must build rapport. Because when you build rapport with your students and your and your and your and your children, when the day comes that you have to reprimand, right, the rapport is built. It means they already love you, and they already respect you. And they honor what you have to say. Right? Because you have built rapport. So when you begin to, to, to reprimand, right, and you do it gently and firmly, right, firm and gentle at the same time, they will listen. Right? Because you already have made us, you know, uh, a rapport for yourself in their hearts. Right? So that's what also some was. Right? Because you will just show a change in his face and say, Fatima Zahra will know something is wrong. Right? And she will immediately she will change it. Right? Because she doesn't want to see the face of Rasulullah. Uh, up, upset with her, and I said, "Not the Mazara." Straight away, she will go out and she will undo what 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 hap- what, what, what she she knew caused his displeasure. That's right. There is called rapport, eh? rapport. All right. So then he says he would tolerate the rudeness and okay, of the of the to certain extent that the Sahaba would hope that a stranger would come and converse with him. Okay, what does this mean? At the Bedouins, they will come right, and they will ask all kinds of questions, and they will really ask. Like really, you know, blatant questions and really like sometimes you know not no shyness in the questions. Right? And and sometimes the Sahaba they like those questions because they want to ask, but they're too shy to ask. Because <laughs> they're afraid that like, you know, what if it's, it's not a, an inappropriate question or it's a stupid question or it's a it's not you know uh, decent enough or whatsoever, you know, is they don't want to ask like like you know outright questions. But the Bedis would do it. And the Bedis would actually go and do it. And the, and the Sahaba would like it <laughs> because they're asking all our questions for us. <laughs> right? and, and once I was in, um, when I was in Tarim, right, uh, and the Westerners, right, the Westerners are now like the Bedouins. <laughs> right, they would come in Tarim, right, of course, they, and they would do all the, the wrong adapts <laughs> right, because, because the, the people have a way. They have a way of, and their adapt is very high. So you have like a Westerner come and like they, they, they always talk, you know, between genders. And they, because they're, used, they're not used to this kind of adapt. Right? And then they will ask all kinds of questions that the Habib will be like, a bit stunned <laughs> with the question. You know, all kinds of questions will come out from them. They, and they ask in Arabic? No, they ask in English. Lah. Then it will be translated to them in Arabic. So, and to the point where there was once, uh, one of the other Mush Habib said, or Hababa said, that alhamdulillah for the Westerners. <laughs> they ask things that we are too shy to ask. Because <laughs> right? you think it's a stupid question. But when it comes from them, the Habib you know, answers the question. <laughs> So alhamdulillah, they, 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 they like the Bedouins of some time. You know, who come they're out of nowhere, they have no clue what's going on, ask all kinds of questions. <laughs> and the Arabs actually appreciate. And they appreciate because now you're explaining to us, you know, things that we, we always wanted, that we never wanted to ask, or too shy to ask.
Okay. So for us, we in the days of course, we be sh very shy, or should we just be? When it comes to affairs of the religion, there is no barrier. There is no shyness. Okay. So when it comes to the affairs of the religion, there is no shyness. Okay. You should ask. Okay. I, I, you should able to ask. And if it comes to things that are specific specific to your gender, then seek out those of your gender to answer those questions. Right? So for the men, if they have issues, you know, uh, pertaining to what the, the male uh, hukum, then they ask the men. Right? When, it, when it comes to women, to our own hukum, we ask the women. Right? But if it's general, general, I can ask anybody. Right? So uh, you should not have shyness stop you from learning your religion. Yeah. Okay, the definition of confident, eh? what does confident mean? Right? So for us, I mean, what I would say is a wrong definition of confidence, right? that people might think that is what it means, is you know, some, if someone goes up on stage and able to speak to an audience, you know, be able to uh, present or carries himself and sits amongst people and, 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 and expresses himself, in our society, they would, they would define that to be confidence. Right? The scholars have said that is not confidence. That is not. That is personality. Some people have that personality, as people don't have that personality. What is confidence? Confidence is doing what is right when everyone does what is wrong. That is confidence. Yeah. That, is, that is confidence. Right? So it could be a shy person who will never be on stage. When time of prayer comes, she goes to pray. Right? Even though nobody in the class prays. Right, so the, the same person who goes on stage all the time and talks and public speaking whatsoever, if you say pray in the airport, pray uh, in the mall, pray, say no, I won't pray. People are watching me. And right, that means no confidence in the truth that they hold. Right, so so I mean, when I heard that definition of the ulama, I was like, <laughs> you know, hands down, lah, that is true. That is confidence. Right, being on stage is just a personality. Some people have it easier to public, public speak. Some people don't have it. So for me personally, I don't, uh, for the children when I teach them, I don't force them. If you don't feel confident, to, if, they, oh, confident eh? if you don't feel that they want to stand in front of the people and, and present, they feel too shy to do that, I allow them to be shy. Right? Because it's their personality that they are shy. And right? not to force them into because it's not their personality. Some kids, it's easier for them to stand up and talk, you know, and they don't feel shy about it. Some children, they don't. And for me, I was one of those kids when I was in primary school. I would never volunteer for anything. Never. <laughs> I would never volunteer. Ever. And I would not be on stage. I would not be part of the class. I would not read in class. I would not do anything in class. I would just sit there and be quiet. <laughs> right, that, is, that was my character. Lah. You know, my character was as such. I was not somebody who liked to be you know, in the limelight. And I still don't <laughs> like to be in the limelight. Right, but when it comes to prayers, you know, you're the only one. And you go to one corner and you pray. Right? No matter what people say. People talk, call you whatever, doesn't matter. Right? You're confident in the truth that you hold. Right. Subhanallah. So, yeah, it's a good definition. I love that definition. That's why I definition. I love the definition. <laughs> right? They're the one who holds on to the truth and nobody else does. Right? You're confident right, of the truth. Right. Subhanallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. The one you want to instill in your kids. And it means no matter where you are, right, you hold on to the Sharia. You fast, you fast. You pray, you pray. You speak the truth when everyone's lying. And so if everybody is uh, lying about something in class, you say the truth. Because you are Muslim. And we don't, we're not liars. Right? So in a sense, you make them, you know, don't follow what everybody else does. Right? But you need to be somebody who holds on to what is the truth. Alright, so I was saying Muhammad. Alright, so when you see, and he says here, right, uh, he used to say, when you see a person in need, you should help and guide him. Alright, so when someone is in need, you should help and guide him. When you see a person in need, the sunnah is that you help and you guide this person, whatever he needs. 
he never accepted any praise if it went beyond what he actually was. Right, and in fact, uh, what it means here that he accepted, right, in a sense, he will not deny it. Right, he will not deny it. Right, but he will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on it. Right, but if somebody went overboard in their praise, right, then he would stop them. Right, he would stop them from doing that. Right, but he won't even, you know, like, like acknowledge the praise. <laughs> you know, like, 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 you know, good, you know, that kind of thing. You know, because when it comes to praises, you know, uh, from people, right, there's a du'a also in Abu Bakr, you should say, right, Allahumma. Allahumma gfir di Allahu no, 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 it goes from Allahumma see that I've got a beginning what's the dua I'll say now when it comes to praise no last one is Allahumma gfir mi Allahumma gfir mi Allahumma la tu akhizi bima yaqulun wa la wa waj'alni khaira mimma ya mimma ya zunnun wa gfir li bima la ya'alamun Ramam does a dua. I remember saying that Abu Bakr would say, "Oh Allah, uh, uh, do not hold me to account for what they say of me, you know, in praise and uh, in praise, eh? And uh, make me better than what they think of me, right? And forgive me for what they don't know of me, right? Because every all of us we know of our faults, you know, of our sins, of our shortcomings, right? So people praise us because they don't see all these, you know, terrible parts of, of our life." You know, so so we will say, you know, yeah, Allah forgive me what they don't know. They don't know a lot of things about me, Subhanallah. You know, so that is the du'a Sayyidina Abu Bakar when he would, uh, when he would, uh, what's in the moment, uh, uh, be be praised. And of course, if you can't remember that, then you say, you know, all praises to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Alhamdulillah. And it means no praises to me because Allah is the one who does everything and not me. And so so we we are lowly. We are human beings. We are never great. And we are never even, you know, uh, good. <laughs> and we are human beings. We are just we are lowly creatures. That's all we are. And we are nothing even for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. No, when you're being praised. You're praising people. When you're praising people, don't you read the No. <laughs> when you're praising people, you say, Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. Alright, so it, uh, he did not interrupt the conversation of a person unless the letter be- went beyond the bounds or digressed from the truth. Right, beyond the bounds meaning begins to uh, gossip or begins to slander or tell lies or be 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 uh, obscene in his speech. Right, so when someone begins to say things that are inappropriate, he will begin. He will stop them by either saying to them, right, may you stop, or he will get up and walk away. Uh, to show them that you know what you are getting into is not something I want to be part of. Uh, so imagine if you can do that if people start to gossip, eh? In front of us. Yesterday my 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 one my, my cousins was saying that someone came to her house and began talking to her for an hour about somebody else. And the whole time she was like, I don't want to know. <laughs> and she's so stressed out. <laughs> but it's her house, so she can't even leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's her house, so she don't know. She didn't know what to do. The whole time, it's the far, the far, the far, the far. Because like she, she didn't know how to stop the person. Right? And I said you should just say lah that I'm so sorry. Uh, can you talk about something else? You know, I'm so sorry. I don't hear this right now. I don't want to hear about someone else. And of course, she said that it's nothing to do with her at all. It's just not, not her, not her, not her, her, her issue. Right? But that person was just letting it out. And I think it happens to us a lot. People come to you and they let things out. And for you, it's like it has nothing to do with you. You can't help the situation. You're basically a third party. That's all you are, a third party. And what do you do? You are supposed to actually here be confident <laughs> and say to them, I'm sorry, can we talk about something else? And, or just bring another topic. Hey, what happened that day? And, you know, bring something else in. You know, Try to change the conversation. And if they keep trying to go back to it, say, I'm sorry, I don't want to hear about this. I really don't want to hear about this. Right? And in doing that, you are saving yourself and her. You are saving both yourself and in allowing her to continue, you are destroying yourself and her. Right? I mean, and you are not a good friend. Right? If you allow her to destroy herself and, and you together right? in, in the gossip. And you know gossip is of the worst, of the worst sins in Islam. Eh? Or the, the kaba, eh? the big sins, the major sins in Islam is gossiping. Yeah, but you need to do it. You need to. You need to. I've done it before sometimes to people that, that sometimes like you know just you say lah that I, I really I don't want to hear this I really, or, you, or you just show a lot of you know like displeasure in the face 
So you're like, no la. Or, it's not even letting you with the hope of getting counsel. Uh, counsel is different if she wants to be counsel. No, no, she wants you to counsel that person. Then if if possible, like the best way is that the person keeps the identity secret. And it's whoever is involved in the matter, like they, they keep the people involved secret. In their names. And their names are secret. So you can say in this situation, like oh, what happened, okay, what what's your advice? And so for me I get it a lot. Right, so and most of and alhamdulillah, I don't know people's families. <laughs> so when they come to me and tell me about their about you know their situation or whatever. I'm very happy I don't know who their families are. And so I, I won't even know who they're talking about. You know, alhamdulillah. And, so, and it's best if, if you want to seek counsel or advice, then you go to someone who is out of the entire scenario, entire situation. Somebody who's completely out and you seek for advice. All right, alhamdulillah. May Allah forgive us. You know, when it comes to this, the matter of, the matter of backbiting is a, it's a struggle. Lah. It's a struggle. Alhamdulillah. Right, he will stop him or walk away. Rasulullah, okay, let's look at the, at the footnotes there. Eh? So the footnotes, first one. They looked towards the ground and paid particular attention to what he was saying. It means they were memorizing. And the Sahaba memorized his speech word forward. At the same time, they were extremely happy and comforted by his speech. This is among the highest forms of showing respect to senior people. I mean, it's the lowering of the heads, you know, and they, they love to listen to him and they were memorizing what he was saying. Wasalam. Number two, this is a form of experience to show how still they were sitting. That means the birds on their heads, eh? Because they were so still, they were not fidgeting, they were not like, you know, doing all kinds of things. It is a well known fact that birds do not sit on anything that has even the slightest movement. It means that those who were present sat up absolutely motionless. <laughs> they did this in awe of Rasulullah out of respect for him and in order to learn and benefit from him. And the kind of, the kind of uh, respect eh, they had for Rasulullah is amazing, the Sahaba. And, how, and, and these are people who were, who were just a few years ago, and they were unrefined you know, and they were very barbaric in the way they were. So for them to go from that kind of people whom the Romans and the Persians used to criticize, you know, as barbarians, lizard eaters, and what they were, they were completely unrefined people, to be what they are in the in the in in the in the presence of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is a great change that happened to a community of people. Number three, he joined them when the occasion demanded. Whenever they laughed or expressed their surprise, he was simply very down to earth, lah, you would say in English, eh? down to earth. Number four, the reason for this was that since strangers and Bedouins are informal in their speech, they would speak with Rasulullah without feeling shy. And some of them would say, Ya O Muhammad, and they would call him by, by his name. Right, the Sahaba, even his own wives and his children, they don't call him Abi, like father, you know, or Zawji, uh, husband. All of them refer to him as Ya Rasulullah. Right. All of, even his children, even his uh, uncles, aunties, right? even his uh, spouses, all of them would only address him as Rasulullah. Right. But the baddies would come and say, Oh, Muhammad, <laughs> like, give me from what Allah has given you. You know, money, our money. That's what he means. Give me from what God has given you. Right. Don't be stingy. Right. That's not what the baddies will do to Rasulullah. And some people will be calm. Right, he won't like scold them or say. He will take them to his house to see what is there, and they will see that he lives in a in a bad house because they assume that oh, you are the leader of the Muslims, so you must be filthy rich. They assume that. So when they go back to his house and they see how bad it is, they begin to feel shy. Right, that I actually you know forced this man to give me something, and I see he doesn't even have anything to give. And that's why Allah, right? Uh, uh, in this way, the Sahaba عنهم, would benefit from whatever questions they posed to him from the answers he provided. Right? Because it was uh, frank questions. Eh? They were all frank questions. All right. So then continuing, Rasulullah gave each of those who were sitting with him the attention he deserved. In fact, each of them would think that he was the most beloved of all people in the sight of Rasulullah wasallam. From this hadith, we learn of Rasulullah's absolute perfection 
kindness, gentleness, forbearance, patience, forgiveness, softness, mercy and noble character. It's amazing how the Arabs, they always, you know, as describe things. There's so many, uh, you know, words of description. There's so many. They will go on and on and on and on and on in how they describe things. So, subhanAllah, like, it's not just enough for them to say kindness. They must say gentleness. And they must say forbearance. And they must say patience. And they must spell it out, like forgiveness, softness, mercy, and noble character. All of which are essential for a teacher who desires to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Can you imagine if every teacher did this? Eh? Every teacher, especially those who handle who handles younger ones, because younger ones they are in, they are in need of forgiveness. Because they make, they are, they're, they're small. They make all kinds of mistakes. Because they're learning. Right? So, so they need teacher, their teacher to be gentle, to be merciful, to be forgiving, right? to be kind-hearted, to play with them, right? to, be, to, to win over their hearts. They need that from a teacher. Because otherwise, how can they learn? And if they feel scared of a teacher, if they are you know, apprehensive, if they, if they stay away, they hate to come to class, how can they learn properly? And how can they fall in love with knowledge right? if they don't like the teacher? You must love the teacher before you begin to love the knowledge, especially for small children. They need to. Right? All the children also, even our teenagers, they're not, they're not excluded. Even for teenagers, when they like the teacher, they begin to learn well. When they hate the teacher, they begin to shut off. Right? And it's unfortunate that they, know they, 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 they link their knowledge or their, their acquisition of knowledge and education to the teacher. Because we know how many teachers are out there are, are basically not you know, like this. <laughs> They are not like this, right? They are something else, right? And that these children begin to, you know, block right, from a subject or hate a subject because there was one teacher, right, that was just, you know, terrible in his character. Right? So they begin to hate a subject because of that one teacher. Right? It's, it's unfortunate, lah. It's common. It's common. It's everywhere. <laughs> it is very high, very, very common. It's one and and when, therefore they hate school. Right? They hate school. They hate this. They hate that. Right? And they hate, they hate subjects that are so beautiful. I was talking to one of my friends who was, you know, uh, who learned Sira, you know, in the madasa, And she said she doesn't like Sira at all. She said, you don't like Sira? Sira is so beautiful. How can you not like Sira? She said, no, the teacher was very mean and very harsh. And I was like, subhanAllah. You know, like, so as, as a child, when you, your first taste of Sira is that, right? then thereafter it's carried on into your adulthood. I don't want to learn Sira anymore. I don't love what the Prophet ﷺ anymore. Like, it's just boring and it's, 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 it's whatever. You know? And they will say things about it. And that's why the, 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 the ulama say that when it comes to Quran, when it comes to Quran, make sure you choose a correct a, a teacher who is passionate, gentle, mercy, merciful. You must. Right? Otherwise, you might destroy your child's uh, relationship with the Quran or his connection with the Quran or his love the, for, for the Quran because the teacher right, was somebody who used to hit. And in the past, you know, it's... They hit, right? they hit, they scold, they, they get angry, right? And they get angry over things that you, you forgot the letter or you forgot the harakat, you forgot this, you forgot that. It's okay if they forgot, subhanAllah. Right? I mean, the children, they don't forget, they, they will remind them, <laughs> right? they will get it sooner or later. You know, don't get angry. Right? So, subhanAllah, so if every teacher, so I'm going to repeat again, eh? I'm going to repeat the, 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 the uh, traits. So, absolute perfection, okay, that one we can't attain, right? That one is the source of Islam. Kindness, right, to be kind, right? The opposite of kindness, harsh. Which you don't be harsh. Gentleness. Opposite of gentleness is hard. Right, to, be, to be hard on people. Forbearance. Right, it means forgiving. Patience. It means to not be impatient right, with, your, with your students, especially when they're trying to learn. Especially if you have students who are, you can sense, as teachers, you can sense those who pick up faster. And those who take time to learn something, you can sense. You know, from a teacher, from a teacher point of view, you know. Right? If some, one of your students is basically, they need time. Or they need one-on-one. -on -one, or they need, you know, uh, private time. And some students, they're very fast. Right? So, you need to, to, to cater your method to the student. Right? However, you should be able to do it. Forgiveness, softness, mercy, and noble character. Alhamdulillah. Okay, read the next hadith. Right, number 11. Rawat Tarmidhi fi shama'il an Sayyidina Ali radiyallahu anhu fi wasfihi li majlisi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
قال كان يعطي كل جلسائه بنصيبه لا يحسب جليسه أن أحد أكرم عليه منه This is of the ways of Rasulullah that I myself find very hard to admit it And because you see previously it was mentioned that he would make every one of his companions feel they are the most loved and the most respected amongst all the companions to the point that one of the companions came to Rasulullah and said Ya Rasulullah he was so convinced he was, he was saying he's Abu uh, Abul As you know he was so con Amr bin Abdul As he was so convinced he was the most beloved uh, Sahaba because of how much attention and love you know and you make eye contact with, with the Sahaba he came to Rasulullah one time and he said Ya Rasulullah who is the most beloved to you <laughs> like because he thought it was him and the answer came Abu Bakr right and then, and then who you know, Omar. And then who? Oh, you know, like, like he came to a list of, of Sahaba. Right? So, subhanAllah, it's just, uh, in another hadith, another Sahaba. No, no, that's another Sahaba. Oh. There's another Sahaba also came to Rasulullah and said, Who's the most beloved people to you? And then, uh, she said the same as Sahaba. Who's the, who's the most beloved people to you? She said, he said, Aisha. So he thought, no, 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 not of the woman, of the man, of the man. <laughs> he wants to hear his name. Right? And then he said, Abu Bakr, you know, I mean, her, her, her father. Right, so in Asmala, it, so that it shows to him that that Rasulullah makes makes everybody feel that they are special. Right. So here, Tirmidhi narrates in Shama'il on the authority of Ali radiallahu anhu in his description of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gathering. He said he used to give his attention to each of to each of those sitting with him. None among those who were sitting ever thought that the other was given more attention by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they all thought that, that, that you know, he was giving them right, the most attention. <laughs> no, I find it very hard to emulate. Uh. It's very hard to emulate. It's bad. You can try. You can try with an intention to try and make it, you know, that, so that your, 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 your students or your children don't feel that you give one child more than the other child. You know, like they, they feel that everybody gets the most. That kind of thing. May Allah teach us how to do this. Eh? Right. So Allah. All right. Uh, okay, we'll pause there. Uh, Hadith 11, eh? And Hadith 12, or that you continue. It's a delightful book to go through, mashallah. Because it's all about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, description. Eh? <laughs> uh, his, uh, his behavior, you know. And, and, it, and, and the, the ulama, they do say that just by reading right, these uh, descriptions, just by reading it, just by reading it and by thinking about it, Right, that this uh, characteristics they will seep into your character. They will. Right. So by reading, pondering, going over and over and over and over again. It's like the Quran. The Quran also when you read the Quran over and over again, even if you, even if you don't understand, your heart begins to be cleansed. Now, even if you don't understand, read the Quran over and over again. These are hadiths by you know you will feel um uh, Muhammad, you will it will seep into you. Because how can you read this kind of things as a believer? And not have it ring in your head. You know, and everywhere you go, you just think about it. And sooner or later, inshallah, it will actually go into your, into your character. And then you will find yourself less hot-tempered. You find yourself, you know, more gentle with your words. You find yourself, you know, uh, easier, you know, easygoing now. Less upstrung. <laughs> you know, less, less you know, high-strung person, you know, whatsoever we are. We are. <laughs> right, Allah SWT allow us to uh, attain something of the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam even 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 if you get a fraction of it right that would you know spell or change our lives there's a fraction of the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was in a vast character and Allah the Lord of the worlds himself testified to that right, when he said innaka la ala khuluqin azim right so if if the god you know the lord of the worlds testify to his character right i mean that is something that is you know amazing if we were to ponder and right, for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we hope right, that some of it rub off on us. Right, we follow him in some way right, of his character, his Zahir and Mabatina, like outward and inward. Right, and in the way he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in the way that he is with the people. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Al-Fatiha. Anna Allah yarzuquna. Anna man nafi'a wa man khayis maqbul. Wa husna al-ta'ani. Mudalala ala al-huda. Wa yusar bi izqam nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ila arwahi mu'alimina. Wa ma shayikhina. وذو الحقوق علينا وإلى أحق نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين